So that's not really a research talk. It's actually more talk directed to um, PhD students and fellow researchers. And perhaps at the end, we can hear some success stories from industry because it's kind of coming based from what I see people doing in industry. So I want to essentially argue for us academics also to do continuous performance tracking as um, various people in the industry do in various forms. So if you're an academic, why should you do it? Well, let's assume just a little scenario. It's 2000, the year 2000, and we are going to write a PLDI paper for the non-academics. That's probably um, not meaning much, but PLDI is essentially one of our top conferences and everybody in our field would like to get a paper there. So what could the paper be about? Well, it could be about possibly a new type system. A lot of people think about making programs more correct by using type systems. Um, another um, thing we could think about is a new way um, to solve security. Perhaps somebody has a brilliant insight that can prevent in 2000 already uh, things like Meltdown and Spectre. So, of course, many of these things would be related to performance in one way or another. And often in these systems that we talk about, like virtual machine language implementations, performance turns out to be some form of volatile metric. So with that, I mean, we don't necessarily can easily predict when the performance changes, even if we think we just change something somewhere else completely separate from what we think about, it can have a performance impact. So it's often hard to clearly think about which changes will actually affect the performance we care about, especially if we think about writing a paper. So it's 2000, the year 2000, and uh, Hotspot just came out. So perhaps we think about how to make Hotspot better. And you probably are aware that Hotspot has tiered JIT compilation. So we could introduce tiered JIT compilation in 2000. That would be the greatest new feature for Hotspot. And we are very creative. Let's, let's assume we just use the same naming convention and we introduce a second compiler and we call that C2. And after a lot of engineering work, we have great results and we see perhaps a plot like that. I hope that comes through properly, especially with the colors. The not very greatly visible yellowish colors, that's what we know as C1. So that's our baseline. And then to the right that we see speed up, we see C2. And if we take the geometric mean over those results, we get a great speed up of 57% um, or something like that, which goes, uh, in the best case, probably uh, they'll be on the 2x speed up. Anyone working on compilers knows these kind of achievements are really great. But of course, for somebody writing a paper, that's just a start. Having done all the engineering to get great results is basically, for a research story, merely the start of writing it down. So when you write it down, as uh, often happens in academia, of course, you kind of take a different perspective. You now kind of have to explain things. Often that means we actually look from a different angle and see perhaps new corner cases. So we have to kind of go back and cover those as well in our implementation. Sometimes just explaining our complicated algorithms makes us think about how can we actually simplify the system. And just in an effort to make it easier for us to even explain the system from, um, from the start. So we may then also go back and actually apply those simplifications to our implementation. Or if you look very carefully here at the plot, and that's something I haven't actually noticed before preparing that presentation, Mandelbrot, which is a very simple, well, kind of simple mathematical, mathematical computation in a loop, so not very um, big benchmark, actually degrades on C2. So we are about 7% slower than on C1. So of course, for a paper, we should go in, uh, figure out what's actually going on, what is our compiler not doing as well as our previous compiler, and possibly how could we improve it. So we need to do more analysis, more understanding, and possibly even fix bugs.
So um, all that means um, we are going to change things. And then we change things, things can go wrong. So here, just one example, that's actually from uh, continuous performance tracking system I'm using. Here, I had a benchmark. Everything was great. It was uh, pretty fast. And then at some point, um, I updated the virtual machine, the compiler I'm using. Uh, in that specific case, it was a graph compiler. And suddenly, it became about three times slower. If you're a PhD student and writing a paper, if you notice that the, deadline, the night before the deadline, uh, 3x speed uh, slowdown, that probably kills your PLDI paper. And you have to kind of go back, figure out what's going on. And then you may come up with, ah, well, there was apparently some semantic bug fixed in some mass operations. And they got replaced in the underlying compiler. And that slowed you down. Um, of course, here the question is, did that actually relate to what you do in your compiler? Did that kind of invalidate your idea that you wanted to report on? So kind of knowing that reason and understanding it may rescue your paper and you can still submit it with your results that you saw that you got. Uh, but of course, you have to know that. So and continuous performance tracking is the main tool to know these things. It's kind of a way to mitigate the risk of changes on your performance. So in my idealized world, writing a paper looks perhaps something like that. We have an idea, we decide on a couple of benchmarks, then we execute those benchmarks, manage the results that we get, store them, analyze them, report them, turn them into paper-worthy plots, and then perhaps at the end, create an artifact from that. So in our specific case, the idea was, let's introduce tiered compilation into our just-in-time compiled system. So again, that's something Hotspot uh, already does, but back in 2000, that would have been great and new. So then, of course, we have to um, choose a set of suitable benchmarks. And arguably, what I chose here wasn't very suitable. It's uh, the RV fast yet benchmarks designed for cross-comparison between languages. Um, but um, yeah, it's a start. So generally, we probably need to think about best case, worst case scenarios, having a good mix of programs, starting from something, perhaps the Renaissance benchmarks or the Carpo, as we have seen before, probably gives us a more representative set of benchmarks. Mm -hmm. So, but actually designing and working out what's suitable is a lot of work in itself. So uh, yeah, that's essentially a topic for, them, for another talk. But once we have benchmarks, you kind of actually have to automate executing them. Because as I already argued, a lot of things can need to change. So when we write, we probably simplify things and want to change our system. So we have to rerun our benchmarks. So the solution is automating the benchmarks. And not everybody does it. Um, so one way of doing that is um, perhaps writing your own little system to do that. I started that in 2010. And um, it's called Rebench, where you have a YAML-based configuration with all the necessary parameters for your benchmarks, and you can kind of execute those. I forced a couple of people using that um, to some uh, success. Um, but of course, everybody has their own thing. The real key point here is automate your benchmark running. Then the next point is, how do you deal with storing the results? Um, my system initially was something like that. So you end up with a lot of data on your hard disk. Often, it's not quite clear what the data belongs to anymore. So you can, in the end, unfortunately, misattribute results, select the wrong benchmark data to make the wrong claims, even lose results, have to rerun experiments, and so on. Again, with the pressure of a paper deadline, these things can be fatal for your paper because you lose time, you lose context, you lose the metadata about um, the things you're measuring. So you want a better system. Um, I have an early prototype, um, RebenchDB, kind of uh, the companion tool to the Rebench benchmark runner to store and analyze results. It tracks performance over time, stores all the metadata, um, perhaps here in terms of uh, commit information, where is actually 
your benchmark results coming from, what does it correspond to in terms of the state of your system. Um, but it also allows you to run custom reports. Here, one example showing the differences um, over time. So specifically to the previous version, you can speed up and so on for specific benchmarks. Uh, again, the key point here is that you need to know your data. You need to know what goes into your paper. You need to understand where the data is coming from, and you have to have one or another structured way of dealing with it. Once you have your data, of course, you still have to interpret it. You have to understand it. You have to be able to communicate the important insights from what you're measuring. You have to actually be aware of what those measurements actually mean, especially in the context of your experiment. And often you have to do that repeatedly. You have to analyze your results again and again after each benchmark run. So I started out um, here, an example from 2010, um, with Excel. Excel is a good tool, very intuitive to use, but it turned out for me it was uh, just too tedious to manually update the benchmark results. I know Excel can also use databases and things, but as a PL person, um, the obvious next step for me was having a proper script, and I decided to learn R. Of course, R is not the only language that uh, allows these things, um, but yeah, that's what I choose. The important key here is that we are able to execute the analysis again, and ideally somebody else can look at it and decide whether we actually do the right kind of math and actually get proper results and don't just mess up the data we have and kind of use statistics to lie about what we actually did. So in the sense of automation, the key point again, we can execute that analysis in an unattended way. And then in the end, we hopefully get a nice paper out of it. For better or worse, as academics, that's really what we need, what we're interested in. We want a paper. We want a piece of write-up that communicates clearly what we learn from our experiments and what we propose other people perhaps to do in their industrial systems. One important uh, problem here is that we actually want to publish correct numbers. So that's not meaning correct results, right? So it's still hard to understand what the hell we actually did and what the benchmarks mean. So, but the lowest thing we can make sure is that the numbers we measured make it actually correctly into our paper. So what I use for that is latte and I generate macros so that from my analysis, automatically the paper, the number gets updated. And then I use those macros perhaps in a piece of latte. And when I write about the performance improvements of C2, then I can refer to the macro as a geometric mean. And that ideally then renders nicely into my paper. And those numbers are always consistent is what I actually measured. So again, at least we get the basics right. We still have to do all the hard work to actually understand that we do, did the right thing. So, and then perhaps also important, of course, are the plots. Here, the same plot I had before in the context of a paper. Very nicely, if you use an integrated uh, tool chain like that, you actually get the typography and font sizes right automatically as well. Oh, but that's kind of polish. So once we publish the paper, um, now we have uh, the question of, can we make our system accessible to other people? And I would argue this putting a lot of effort into automating continuous performance tracking, we kind of are at a point where we just need one single extra script, and I have been blogging about that before, you see the link below. Um, to turn that whole sort of setup into an artifact, which then can be evaluated. So here the idea is you take your scripts, make it executable for others, package it up to a virtual machine image, perhaps, that people can simply use and verify that the research that you did actually makes sense. So again, automation greatly simplifies that process and itself can also be automated. So back to our um, analysis benchmarking cycle, so the general one here and perhaps the specific one um, with my tool chain here. Key point is try to automate the different steps. Try to be able to run your benchmark, your analysis, 
and the data storage automatically and avoid having to handle things manually, which can break and easily uh, introduce bugs. Um, I do that in the context of my CI system. So we actually have a self-hosted uh, GitLab runner here at Kent, um, where we simply execute these things um, whenever we um, push to the system to run benchmark. And that really makes it easy to run benchmarks and get results. So what are the benefits and drawbacks? Well, we can detect bugs, performance bugs, easy. And those don't kill our papers because we notice them early enough ahead of time to make sense of them, to understand whether it has an impact or not. Um, we know where our data is, what our data is. We don't have to kind of uh, go back, re-benchmark, because uh, we didn't note down when we measured what and what it was exactly that we measured. That's all done automatically. And of course, that's all supported by having our experimental setup in an executable form, which we can simply execute when needed. OK, good. So what doesn't work so well? Well, we have, of course, more data. But more data doesn't mean more insight. It still needs analysis. It needs time to actually understand what we are doing. Um, of course, it also may mean that we need to do more engineering. So here, we really want to get to a point where we no longer do quick and dirty things and just push for the next paper. But overall, hopefully, all that investment uh, leads to fewer mistakes, faster feedback, and overall increased productivity, as does our continuous integration and automatic testing, which we should be doing anyway already. Other drawbacks. Of course, there's no guarantee that we do the right thing. In any step of the chain, we can still introduce misinterpretation, misunderstanding of the data, or we don't measure anything useful to begin with by choosing the wrong benchmarks. Um, automation in that kind of form can also make it hard to then actually do the right thing because it works. We have a thing that works, and we have always been doing like that. So it can make us complacent. So that's kind of something to be aware of. And we shouldn't rest on just having the automation. We actually still need to think about whether it's the right thing to do. OK, let me conclude. So I would argue that if you have a paper uh, that uses something like um, performance as a volatile metric, you really want a continuous performing tracking uh, pipeline. If you change anything, you need to rerun your benchmarks. and you have to rerun the different steps of getting from the raw data to the insights for your paper. So as I use something existing, there are a couple of um, tools out there from the various big language implementation systems. Everyone has their own system, essentially, or build your own. My recommendation would be keep it simple, but keep measuring. And then hopefully, you can publish your ideas with confidence and report your data correctly. And that's it. So here is my example that I'm using. Um, but of course, that's just one of uh, many, many possible ways of doing that. And I'm happy to take questions.